Well, the presidential candidates have been making their case to early state voters for months now. 2024 is officially here, and the first votes are just weeks away. Our Politics Monday team is here with a look at the busy year ahead. That's Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report with Amy Walter and Tamara Keith of NPR. Well, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> it's great to see you both. So look, I'm told by a source familiar that as early as tomorrow, Donald Trump's legal team could file challenges uh, to the pair of rulings both in Maine and Colorado that knock him off those states' primary ballots. Tam, in the days that, the days that have passed since then, how has his campaign sought to capitalize on those rulings? Here is another instance of something that happened that caused people who oppose Donald Trump to come to his defense. These are the sorts of events that he thrives on and benefits from. Uh, and so you had anti-Trump Republicans being interviewed and saying, well, you know, I don't think he should be running. I don't think he should win. But in this case, he shouldn't be pushed off the ballot. And, and this is a, a situation where you even have liberals, uh, people on the left, who feel that, you know, this could be dangerous territory, that this could create a situation where anyone could be removed from the ballot. Uh, anyone could say something is insurrection if, if even without there being a conviction yet. Um, interestingly, the, the main secretary of state was interviewed by my colleague, uh, Scott Detrow, and she said that uh, they welcome the Supreme Court weighing in, in fact, because uh, this is incredibly murky territory. And the, that uh, Secretary of State has received death threats yes. since that ruling. <laughs> Meantime, you've got Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis both saying that if they are elected, they would pardon Donald Trump if he's convicted on any one of the 91 felony counts he faces. Here's what Nikki Haley said late last week. If he is found guilty, a leader needs to think about what's in the best interest of the country. What's in the best interest of the country is not to have an 80-year-old man sitting in jail that continues to divide our country. What's in the best interest of the country would be to pardon him so that we can move on as a country and no longer talk about him. So this is the persistent question. How can either Haley or DeSantis distinguish themselves when they continue to court Donald Trump's base of supporters? Well, and question many of the legal challenges right. against him. You know, I think it's important, though, to go back, even before this campaign started, to where a lot of this began, which was right after the 2020 election, where after January 6th, Republicans had an opportunity in to impeach the president, obviously did not. Going into 2022, the January 6th commission was supposed to be a bipartisan commission. The Senate... Uh, Republicans there said, we don't want to do that or support that. On the House side, obviously, Speaker McCarthy pulled Republicans that he had picked to be on that committee. So f from the really from the very beginning, I guess this campaign basically started at the end of uh, 2020, uh, 2021, um, Republicans in power have been basically saying to the voters, we think that this is Okay, it's not okay to criticize him, and it's certainly not okay to see that some of these very critical issues, whether it is January 6th, Mar-a-Lago, the documents there, are worthy of questioning whether he is, forget about even guilty, whether he should be a candidate, a serious, considered a serious candidate for office. So that's the position that those presidential candidates find themselves in all these months later, the ground was already tilled by the previous Republican leadership. And that's the, the I guess, maybe mixing a metaphor, but, um, <laughs> you know, that's the, that's what they're going to have to, to, to deal on that environment, in that environment. Yeah. And, and Tam, meantime, Nikki Haley is ascendant in New Hampshire. She, of course, faced criticism from DeSantis and Christie after her comments about the, the cause of the Civil War. The two of them certainly see vulnerability. Is there time for her to sort of um, manage the momentum ahead of, of of the primary in New Hampshire? I mean, the the exciting thing is, is that the, the primary in New Hampshire is just three weeks away. Uh, we have the Iowa caucuses just two weeks away. Vote, actual real life voting is going to happen. We aren't going to have to talk about polls. Uh, I mean, we probably still will, but we're going to be able to talk about actual voting and, and real momentum and not just perceived momentum. Um, and and so this is this is a key crunch time, and it's all it's, it's actually almost like very um, 
normal in this very abnormal year to have a candidate who is ascendant suddenly have a controversy that everyone's talking about. Um, what isn't clear is what, what that controversy will mean with voters. Um, she is someone who has been trying to get those suburban voters, those independent voters, the, the sort of non-Trump Republicans. And so does... Uh, fumbling on this and, and having to answer it a few times and saying somebody was basically trying to ask her a trick question um, about something that should be pretty easy to answer. Um, just talk about the civil, we'll just talk about slavery. Um, you know, does that hurt her with the very voters that she needs as part of her coalition? Is Chris Christie able to make the case that he's trying to make? Um, or is, is the governor of New Hampshire able to make the case that he's able to, uh, trying to make, which is, don't look at that, and Chris Christie, you should go away. Yeah, <laughs> which yeah. is the the argument that's being made over the weekend. Right. Well, well, meantime, looking ahead to the the general, we were talking before the broadcast about how uh, both of you increasingly encounter yeah. people in your reporting and in your research who have this sense of disbelief that this will be a Biden-Trump right. matchup. That's yeah. why we, we have these discussions every week about, well, how is this issue going to impact voters? What do you think voters? Yeah. How are they going to react to this? And so many voters, this isn't just folks who are not maybe paying close attention, this includes people who are paying close attention to this election, are still in disbelief that the two candidates will be Donald Trump and Joe Biden. That at some point, something's gonna happen and we will have two different, so, uh, two different nominees. And so when we talk about all of this stuff for so many voters, they really aren't pricing it in yet because it is not something that they really at this point believe is going to be true. And I don't know when that's going to kick in. Hmm. Will we have to wait until the actual uh, conventions? Will it be earlier that, than that? I don't know. But even at the conventions, I've had people come say to me, maybe one of the candidates will drop out at the convention. <laughs> yeah. And I have, I have had people literally say, who are you going to be covering in, in 2024? Are, are really Joe Biden's running for president? Yes, yes, he is running for re-election. I uh, repeatedly have spoken to people who are in disbelief that, that he really is going to follow through with it. Let me tell you, there is a campaign infrastructure in place. He is really running for president. Right, we should right. be clear. And Donald Trump is, yes. is really, really running, running yes. for president and building yes. a ground game in Iowa and trying to finish this off early yep. uh, so that... Um, if trials were to start later in the spring, he could be distracted by those trials because he'd already basically de facto be the nominee. Yeah. Well, here we are the first day of 2024. What is the biggest political story you're watching outside of the election yeah. looking forward? Um, I'm really fascinated by the group of voters that Donald Trump did better with in 2020 than he did in 2016, Latino voters. We remember in 2012, after Republicans lost the, those previous elections, 2008 and 2012, they did this autopsy saying, this party's not gonna survive if we don't do better reaching out and winning over Latino voters. They then nominated Donald Trump, who talked about Muslim bans and building the wall. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yet, in 2020, he did quite well with with Latino voters much better uh, than many Republican candidates have, and with African-American voters. There are a lot of Republicans who believe that a coalition is being built right now. Donald Trump's at the head of it, but it may not always need Donald Trump to be there. A more um, multiracial populist coalition, sort of a working class multiracial coalition that will be the new Republican party. And we get 2024 to be our second test case. Tim? I'm looking way, way, way down ballot. Uh, things like mayor's races or uh, county commissioners or, or election administrators. In the last couple of years, down ballot races have gotten a lot of national attention. In some ways, many of those races have been nationalized. And what I'm watching to see is whether in a year when there is a presidential race that gets all this attention, whether those races will continue to be nationalized, whether, you know, the mayor of Kenosha, Wisconsin, will get uh, big money uh, from outside of mm -hmm. the state. Tamara Keith and Amy Walter, thanks for being here. Thank You're you. welcome.